gentlemen, welcome to a special edition of the Money Mondays. I have a special guest here that traveled all the way to the ranch. We're here in Temecula, California at the Wild Jungle. 26 acres of animals. There's 188 animals outside to my left. There's a whole military training obstacle course for the Operation Black Side to my right. And sitting here at this table is a three-time best-selling author of a book called The Coffee Bean. He's going to tell you an amazing story of how he went from the jail cell to speaking in over a thousand stages around the planet. Please will give a warm round of applause to Mr. David West. All right, Dan, thanks a lot, man. Dude, I've been I, I, like, I'm getting to come to the ranch and seeing it like in person. After I, I see the stuff that you post, because I follow all your stuff. I follow Tarzan stuff right. too. And you drove me around this morning. I got to see it all in person, and it's so different seeing it in person. And the thing uh, we saw the, the Zorse. The Zorse, yeah. Yeah. That was it's cool. Like it was magical. It was magical. It was like a unicorn. Yeah. Like, and, and I sent it to my little stepdaughter that's 11, and she'll get a kick out of it too. But um, it's like you have bought yourself an island here, like Fantasy Island. Yeah. It's beautiful out here. This is I'm, I'm so impressed with what you've done, brother. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you're here. Normally, we are in an RV motorhome where I drive around the country to go to people. It worked out a good timing. You were already speaking in Temecula, so you could just pop right over. Bada bing, bada boom. Here we are. So... On the Money Mondays, we keep the episodes to under 45 minutes. We try to be around 35 to 40 minutes because the average workout is 45 minutes. The average commute to work is 45 minutes. And so we want to be around that 40-minute mark. That way, you guys can listen to all this as you're getting in and out of your car, going to your workout, going to work, etc. You get to hear about Damon West's amazing story and why he's spoken on so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stages around the planet. So the way we do this is we talk about three core topics, how to make money, how to invest money, how to give it away to charity. Now... Even though we're talking about money, not all things take money. Damon's also going to talk about charity-related efforts that don't exactly take cash. It's more about effort, time, and energy where he'll help people in prisons or help people stay out of prisons. But first, we want to do a quick two-minute bio, give everyone the idea of what's going on in your world so we can get straight to the money. Yeah, so you know, I, I, got, I listen to your podcast. I've listened to every episode, so I've been thinking, like, what is my two-minute version? Here it is. <laughs> all right, so... Um, I go around, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker and best-selling author. I'm also a college professor because I went back to school and got a master's in criminal justice and became a professor at the University of Houston downtown teaching a class called Prisons in America. But that's a little side gig that I do. I only have one class. But I go around sharing the story of the coffee bean. And the coffee bean message is a message that I got from a guy in Dallas County Jail named Mr. Jackson. And it was right after I was sentenced to life in prison back in 2009 for engaging organized crime. RICO. Everybody's talking about RICO right now in America, wow. right? I went down for Rico as the mastermind, and, I, and I'll tell everybody how Rico Whoa, works. Okay. Yeah, that's what I went down for. I, <laughs> I went down for Rico. Life. Wow. I yeah, I got sent to life in prison in 2009. But you're here, right? <laughs> yeah. <it's>, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and that's the whole story. Like, I made, I made parole. I made it out. But here's the deal: I'm not a free person because I, I'm not a free man because I'm on parole in the state of Texas <laughs> until the year 2073. Come on. Yeah, man. I'm on parole the rest of my life. 50 more years. Yeah, 50 more years. I got out. It was 58, Dan. I'm chipping away at this thing, brother. But in 2009, so the jury sentences me on May 18th, 2009. My mom tells me that I can't, I mean, right after the trial's over, they give my parents five minutes with me and they say, hey, listen, my mom, my mom's saying, listen, you, you can't go off and get in one of these Aryan Brotherhood type gangs. No gangs, no tattoos. She said, no gangs, no tattoos. You come back as the man we raised or don't come back to us at all. Why does she think you're going to come back when you just got life in prison? Like, what is it? Well, because I have a non-aggravated life sentence. And so this is a good question you asked because a lot of people are like, how did you get out? There's two kinds of felonies, uh, two kinds of classes of felonies in Texas and in most states, aggravated and non-aggravated. Aggravated crimes are violent crimes, crimes where there's a physical victim. Think murder, rape, assault, child molesters. Those are aggravated offenders. My crimes were property crimes. It was a bunch of other meth addicts breaking into homes um, to sell off the, the goods for meth. And I was the ringleader of all those meth addicts. There was about a dozen people. They called it the Uptown Burglaries. It was the Uptown Burglary Crime Spree. They called me the Uptown Burglar. That was the name, the moniker I got from this crime spree. Sounds like a movie. Yeah, it's it's going to be a movie. <laughs> there you go. Um, and it's, it's going to be a wild movie. But um, the Uptown Burglary Crime Spree... Um, I was a stockbroker in Dallas in 2004, working for UBS. Hmm. And another broker introduced me to meth one day. I'm sleeping at work. He wakes me up. He's like, you know, wake up, dude. He said, you can't sleep on this job. The markets are open. You're messing with people's mm -hmm. money. He said, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 and so he says, come on down to the parking garage. I got something that'll pick you up. Wow. And so, and I'm into blow at this point. I mean, I'm not, it's not like I'm not doing drugs. I am into drugs and alcohol. But that day, he introduced me to meth for the first time. I've never touched a drug like meth before, and, it, and I was instantly hooked, man. Yeah. I mean, just like like that. 18 months later, 
I'm living on the streets of Dallas. Wow. I'm homeless, dude. I've, I've smoked everything, man. And that's how I did it. I smoked it. Oh, my God. I've smoked everything. I'm homeless, man. I live in dope houses. I've slept on park benches. And, uh, and then I became a criminal to feed my addiction. I, I, and my crimes were property crimes. And that's your, back to your original question. So I committed a bunch of burglaries and other property crimes, thefts. Think about a crime where no one's home. Uh, never saw my victims. They never saw me. No weapons were used in the crimes for me. No one got hurt right. physically. Now, it doesn't mean I didn't hurt people in different ways because I, I want to always say this, Dan. When I broke into people's houses, my victims, I didn't just steal property from my victims. I stole something they'll never get back. That is their sense of security, brother. Exactly, their safety, yeah. I stole it. Yep. And I don't know if my victims ever get that back. I assume that they don't. And, um, and they'll live with that for the rest of their lives. And the thing about you know, being on, being on felony pr- pr- parole the rest of your life in Texas, they have a law that says you can't apologize to your victims. If you ever attempt to make an apology, really, they'll send you back to prison. So I'll never make an apology to them because it makes no sense for me to do that and go back to prison. Right. I mean, I work a program recovery called AA and AA, we have the steps and on the eighth step, you have a list of all the people you've made, you've harmed. And the ninth step is when you make an amends to them, if, except when to do so would cause you or them harm. Hmm. That's this category because I can't think any percenters them actually know it's Damon West, the uh, three time bestselling author, is the one that broke into their house. Yes, some of them have reached out to me really? in their own way. Most of it's, you know, most of it's not positive. Sure, and and I get that, and and you know what, and and I own that. And every time I've ever had a victim that's, that's reached out, it's been by email or through social media. Mm-hmm. You and I were talking about social media, the power of it. Yeah. Um. Every time it's happened, I, I turn over the communication to my parole officer, Miss Braggs, and she'll she'll say, you cannot respond. Wow. Yeah, and I can't. I can't respond. I can't apologize. I can't respond. I just have to take it. Fascinating. And she's like, that's the, you know, that's part of the, the, the price you have to pay for what you did. And I get that. And I own that. Um, I did. I did all the crimes. They said I did. But because my crimes were non-aggravated, it means I, w- I have a chance to make parole sure. a lot sooner. So. If you have an aggravated violent crime in Texas, you have to do half of your prison sentence before you see a parole voter. So if I had a, if you have a life sentence, if you have a life sentence, so oh my God. In, in Texas, this doesn't sound I, good. I still don't get it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, so in Texas, they stop calculating time at sixty. And so because sixty years is a natural life sentence, because if you have to be seventeen to go to prison, right. sixty on top of that, right. that's a human lifespan. Right. So everything stops calculating at 60. So when someone says 65, which is what the jury gave me that day, they gave me 65, or they say 99, hmm. it all means life because anything 60 and above is life. So an aggravated offender has to do 30 calendar years before they see parole oh for the first my time. God. And Dan, I live on the life 30. sentence building. I live on the life sentence building of a maximum security, of, of a supermax. And what they what? do is they take all the lifers and they put them on one building. To segregate them out from the because they want you to get escaping off your mind. So you have to live on that building for five years. You can't come off the building. It's an island. Right? It's the most dangerous place I've ever seen in my life because there's no hope on this island. It's the life sentence built. 432 people, seven buildings. This is a building I lived on on the Styles unit. Everybody's got life, man. Right. And it's the most dangerous world you've ever been. Right, because what do they have to lose? Not much. I was on a pod one time. There was 48 men on this one pod, G-Pod one section. 48 men on this pod. 12 of the guys had life without parole. One fourth of your pod are nuclear bombs. They'll never see a parole officer. Nothing to lose for these guys, right? But I have non aggravated life. So this is the deal. The final answer to your question non aggravated means that you can see parole after you've done 25% of a life sentence. Now, you're good with math. That's 15. 15. So 15 years. But if you're non aggravated, you get access to something that an aggravated defender doesn't get. You get access to good time credit and work time credit. So here's how good time works. Every day that I'm in prison and I don't get in any trouble, I get another day. I get one for one of good time. Every day that I'm there and I'm willing to work because inmates really do run the asylum, every day I'm willing to work, I get a half a day credit. So when I got to six calendar years of real time, two point five days. there's six more years of good time. Yeah, yeah. There's 12. Yeah. There's three years of work yeah, time. That was 15. Yeah, six times 2.5. And I was eligible for parole, you know, and they got to me finally is right at the seven year mark. Um, I was eligible for parole, and, and I actually made it. Most people never make their first parole, not seven years. I, I was pretty sure I would do 10, maybe 15 years on that life sentence. And, and incidentally, Dan, 15 years is this year. It's 2023. Hmm. 2008 is when I went in. Wow. 2023 is when I thought I was getting out, literally this year. But I've been out for eight years now. But here's the story of the coffee bean. So 
Right after my parents give me that talk, I'm in Dallas County Jail. I got two months before the prison bus comes to pick me up. And I'm asking every guy that's in county jail, how am I going to survive? What am I going to do? And, and every guy I talk to in there, man, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, they all say the same thing. You have to get into a gang. Man, don't listen to your mom. Right. Your mom's not even your family. Now, they said the gang is your family. Right. Obey the gang. But there was this one guy that was so different, this old black man named Mr. Jackson. And Mr. Jackson, well, he was a career criminal. He's been in and out of prison his entire life. Most positive guy I've ever met, though, Dan. He had a smile on his face everywhere he went. And uh, every morning, he would come up and check on me. He'd, he'd come to my bunk, and he'd pick me up like a ray of sunshine in a dark place with this positive energy. So one morning, he comes up to me. And, and I know my time is limited in the county jail. The prison bus is about to come pick me up. And he says, he's like, listen, West, don't listen to these idiots about getting to a gang. But let me tell you what prison is going to really be like. So he tells me, the first thing you need to understand about prison, it's all about race. He said, race runs the whole institution. The inmates want it to be about race. Everybody breaks off in their own racial group when they get to the life sentence building, prison in general. Um, he said, when you walk in the door, the white gangs get the first dips on you because you're white. That means you have to fight all of them off. Aryan Brotherhood, Aryan Circle, White Knights, Woods. He names all the white gangs. He said, if you survive that, now you fight the black gangs. And the, black ga the white gangs will send the black gangs after you. So the Crips, the Bloods, the Gangster Disciples, they're all going to want to get a piece of this white guy that won't get in line and get with his own race. Wow. And he said, but if you survive all that and you can survive all that, you'll earn the right to walk alone. He said, the strongest man in prison always walks alone. He told me the truth about fighting, Dan. And this is why people, when they hear this story, it, it gravitate. People love stories that have these three elements to it. They, have, they love stories of overcoming adversity, you know, inspirational stories, stories that have sports, and then they love stories about prison. And so this is where it really gets into it. He says, you don't have to win all your fights, but you do have to fight all your fights. And he said, some days you're going to win and some days you're going to lose. He said, do not worry about winning these fights. He said, just show up and fight. No one in prison cares if you win. They just want to see if you're going to defend yourself. Interesting. And so he told me, he said, I need you to imagine prison like it's a pot of warm water. He said, you have three choices how you're going to respond to this pot of warm water. You can be like the carrot that becomes soft, the egg that becomes hard in a pot of warm water, or you can be like a coffee bean, which changes the pot of warm water into a pot of coffee. And he said, the coffee bean is the only thing that can change the water west. He said, the carrots are changed by the water. The eggs are changed by the water. You're going to see a lot of those in there. But coffee beans change the water. They're the change agent. In fact, my first book, my autobiography, is called The Change Agent. And he's telling me, he's like, you, you know, everybody in life puts out energy, negative or positive. Whatever kind of energy you put out, you attract back. The law of attraction. We know this. And you see this all the time where you go. You attract positive people. So he's telling me, he said, you can't walk around with a mean look on your face or look down. People that are negative attracted to that. He said, walk around with a smile on your face. No matter where you go, no matter what happens. Walk around jail with a smile on your face. Walk around prison, have a grin on your face. Really? Man. Yeah, he said, just just do it, man. Just just trust me on this. He said, walk around with a smile on your face. And he said, you are, this is what he said too. He said, you're going to be a light in a dark place and they're going to want to extinguish that light. They're going to try to kill you. Right. Man. Like, what are you smiling at? Yeah, and, and, you know, but he said, if you get through this, on the other side of that, you are going to be the change agent in that place. You'll be the one that attracts other positive people. And the other positive inmates, the other coffee beans in prison, they'll find you. He said, there's other coffee beans out there. He said, they'll find you, but you have to be that beacon mm. of light in there. And the last thing he ever said to me, the last words he ever spoke to me on earth, he said, West, be a coffee bean. And that was it, man. The prison bus comes to pick me up. I go serve. I go start serving this life sentence. And one of the toughest prisons in Texas, man, the Mark Styles unit in Beaumont, Texas. This is like... One of the toughest prisons in Texas, it's one of the toughest prisons in America. And remember, Dan, I went back to school after I got out of prison, and I got a master's in criminal justice, and I teach a class at the Well, I'm not teaching this semester. I'm just too busy. But the class is called Prisons in America. So I'm the only professor on earth to teach a prisons class at a university who lived in prison. Right. So I know a lot about tough prisons, and um, the journey, the story that I talk about with all these audiences is about how I was able to transform myself in that pot of warm water. Cause there's no bigger pot of warm water. You know, we talk about the fears people have in life. We talked about, you know, public speaking snakes and stuff like that, but almost universally I hear from people that one of their biggest fears is to have to go to prison. And there's a good reason why prison's a very difficult place to live, difficult place to survive. It's like the movie Shawshank, one of the best movies ever made, but it's the best prison movie ever made because it depicts the fact that prison is a very hopeless place. There's no hope in prison. And, um, I decided I was going to be the face of hope, and and that's what I was in there. And the parole board saw the transformation made. They saw that I became that coffee bean. In fact, you know, the instructions from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice are to go out to society and find more coffee beans. And so I get out of prison November 16th, 2008, 
2015. My parents are waiting there to pick me up and they bring me back home to their house. And, and so, I mean, I'm going to paint this picture for your audience. So I'm, I'm 40 years old. I just got out of prison. I live in my parents' spare bedroom. I got a job making minimum wage. I'm on parole for the rest of my life. You know, I mean, if I would have had like a Tinder profile, it would have sucked. It would have been terrible, right? But, um, but I wasn't on any dating apps and stuff like that. But when I got out, when I was in prison, I started working on myself and I thought, you know, if I could transform myself inside this place, I would have a great story to tell and I can motivate people and inspire people. But I've, I've got I've to be able to do it in here and become the best version of myself possible, like my mom wanted me to be. And so when I got out, I wanted to go around and, and speak. But it was very hard. No one was letting a guy that just got out of prison come in. You can't just knock on the door of a school and say, hey, I just got out of prison. I want to talk to your kids. They may lock you back up. So I uh, had to convince this law enforcement officer and this judge in my area to sponsor me to take me in. And it was hard at first. And, and I didn't have a lot of places to go speak. But I started doing it in my little area, southeast Texas, where I live. And it started catching on a little bit. I didn't make any money at first. You know, and, and we talk about making money on this podcast. And um, look, when I started doing this, there wasn't any money involved. It was a passion. And I think one of the b- ways to answer the question, how do you make money, is you provide a service to other people. You provide something that is of value. And, and now I'm the guy that other potential speaker or other people that want to be speakers reaches out to on social media. They're like, hey, I want to be a speaker. I want to do that. My first question is, how do you add value to the audience that you're going to speak to? What do you do to add value to them? Because that's really what it's about, is adding value back in the world. And um, it was tough. Um, I, you know, the first year, I think I made $500 speaking. But again, money wasn't the thing driving me. It was a passion. But then people started hearing about the story. And do I have time to tell a story about how my life transformed? We don't really do stories here. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't I want to teach about money. Yeah, let's, let's go about money. So anyway, but... Eight years down the road, um, I've turned this speaking platform into a, a multiple seven-figure business. I mean, for the last three years, I've made over seven figures a year speaking, going around all over the world, sharing the story of the coffee bean with audiences. So when you first got out of jail, they give you $200, right? Like walkie money? Or they, give they, you, they give you $100 gate money. Gate money. Yeah. So how do you go from gate money to speaker money? Like, how do, what's that look like? Yeah. Um, so I had... I got my hundred dollars gate money, and um, luckily I had a job at a law firm right when I got out of prison. Um, I did my own legal work when I was in prison. Really? Yeah, I, and I went to law. I was trying to get myself out. Biggest motivator in the world, right? Your freedom <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, um, so I go into the law library, and there was a guy named named uh, Mr. Brandon. In my book, I call him Mr. Winston, but Stephen Brandon, this old guy in prison, showed me how to use the law library. He gave me a tutorial for one one day. Two bags of coffee is what he what he charged me to teach him teach me about the books, the Black's Law Dictionary, stuff like that. Put together my own writ, uh, tried to get myself out, but these lawyers took notice of my writ, and they said, hey, look, man, you put together a hell of a writ for a guy who's never been to law school. If you ever get out, come see us. We've got a job for you. So that was my first job out of prison. I was working at a law firm, and on the side, I would go and do some speaking stuff. and um, For free. For free. I w- because that's the thing about it, Dan. I mean, I had to get in front. Of, you got to get in. You got to get in reps, right? Sure. You got to get in reps. And, and the first, I tell people all the time, the first two years I was out of prison, there weren't a lot of places for me to speak. But in my parents' spare bedroom, there was a mirror. It just happened to be there when I moved in. Almost every night for two years, Dan, after I would get home from work, get home from the gym, go to my AA meetings, I'd get in front of that mirror and I'd practice the presentation that I'm doing today in front of that mirror. I got a rep in every day for almost two years, man. Hmm. And that's how I got good at my craft. I was willing to put in the work and build that presentation up. Even if I didn't have an audience, I got my presentation in every day. And um, then the real break came in 2018. John Gordon reaches out to me because Dabo Sweeney is a mutual friend of ours, the coach at Clemson. Dabo tells John about me. And John's like, hey, man, he reaches out to me. He's like, Dabo gave me your number. He told me your story. He said, Damon, the world needs the coffee bean message. Let's deliver this message to the world. Will you write a book with me? We'll call it the coffee bean. By the way, guys, John Gordon has 26 books. Just to give you context of who he's talking about, John Gordon has 26 books. One of the biggest motivational speakers and authors in the world. This guy, he's massive. Mm-hmm. And when he reaches out to me blindly in 2018, hell, I know who John is. I follow John on Twitter. But I'm like, how, John, how do you know who I am? And he's like, Dabo, man. Dabo is the one. He's the connector. Dabo is a connector, too. He's an incredible guy. And um, so we write the book, The Coffee Bean, and it comes out in 2019, 10 years exactly since I first heard The Coffee Bean in a, in a, in a jail cell from Mr. Mm-hmm. Jackson in 2009. And uh, it 
rocketed me to a whole different level. And John gave me some of the best advice about building my brand that I've ever heard anybody get. And it's something I've always held on to. John told me this when we were writing the book. He said, Damon, he said, your message is powerful. Your story is powerful. Stick with it. Do not change your message. Your message is be a coffee bean. He said, stick with that thing. Do not ever change your message. He said, because what happens to people a lot of times is they, they don't see the results fast enough. You're trying to build a brand. You don't see the results fast enough. And then you're like, well, let me change my message. Maybe that'll help. Well, now all you do is just confuse people. Are you the coffee bean guy or are you this other guy, right? Mm -hmm. But he said, stick with that. He said, Damon, if you do that, one day you'll be known as the coffee bean guy. And that'll be something pretty valuable to be known as, pretty pretty important in society to be known as. He said, people know me as the energy bus guy. One of the first books I ever wrote. But if you can stick with your brand, you'll be something, you'll be something one day. So how does someone that wants to become a speaker and they're putting those reps in, they're doing free events, they're throwing their own events, they're going to more free events. When is that shift? When do they know they could finally say, hey, pay me 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or two grand or 5K or 10K or 25K, et cetera. Like when do they know or what's that turning point when you can actually decide to charge to speak? I think a good barometer for that, that's a very good question, Dan, because I, I think a good barometer for that is when you're starting to get calls back from people that may have been in the audience when you spoke at an event. And it, like when you're starting to get more gigs because someone was in the audience and heard you speak and they reach out to you and said, hey, I was, I was at this event you spoke at and this, you know, it's great because you want to always have, and this is something you talk about too, you, all, all your social media should look uniform. All your different social media platforms you're on should have the same picture, all the same information. But you should have that in front of people so they can find you and your website too. When people start reaching out and finding you from an event you spoke at, then you know you have something that is of value. Yep. And and then you start charging. It gives you more confidence. And, and um, then you start, you know, you can start making some money off this thing. But the the, the catch-22 is that most of, most of us that start out, I don't know, I, I can only speak from my, my uh, level of what I did speaking. I started out, I didn't make anything. I didn't, I didn't know I could make anything. I just knew that I had a story to tell, and I felt like this is one of the reasons God got me out in the first place. And then the money just came. And John told me, John gave me some good advice. He asked me one day when the, after the coffee bean was on the Wall Street Journal bestselling list for like four or five weeks, man. It was unheard of what this book was doing. The, and, and now the book is all over the world. It's in every language in the world, Chinese, Spanish, Arabic. French. It's got a global publishing deal. John's like, what are you charging? I told him. He said, no. He said, now, today, your rates are this. Mm -hmm. And he said, you start asking for that. And, and the number he threw out at me, I was like, oh, man, I don't know, John. I don't know about asking. And I'll tell you what he told me back then. This is like kind of funny looking now. He's, he's like, ask for $10,000. He said, that's what, you, that's yeah. what you need to start. That's what you need to be at now. And I'm like, $10,000. That's hmm. so much. And it was sure. so much money. back. It's, still, it's a lot of money. I mean, of course. but I did. I started asking and, and I started getting it. And, but, you know, if you don't ask for that, um, another thing, advice for people wanting to be speakers and this is something I learned from another speaker. One thing is you have to always be willing to be coachable. You have to be coachable, be willing to learn, because anybody can be a teacher, man. And some people teach you how to do things the wrong way. Some people do things the wrong way, and they teach you how not to do something, right? So another speaker shared this with me. He looked at my website. He said, hey, man, look, your contact form is great. Your website's awesome. But you don't have a space in your contact form for people to put their speaker budget in there. Why don't you have that? Because if you had that, then they could tell you what their budget is, and then now you know what numbers you're working with, you know. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my God. So I put a speaker budget button, button on there, and it changed my life. Yeah. It changed my whole business platform because now people were showing me that I've been leaving money on the table a lot, you know. And that's, that's important. I mean, because there's nothing wrong with making money. Making money, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, and when you find your niche, if you're a speaker that you add value to the places, the money will come. So on the author side, let's put your author hat on, someone decides they want to write a book. It's a big undertaking. It does change their life because now authors, you know, part of their brand, personal brand forever. What is that step when it's time to like, I'm going to write a book like The Coffee Bean. I want to finally write a book. What are the steps that someone needs to do to really make that decision and like figure out what that ethos is of that book? And then how the heck do they make money from a book? Good questions. Damn, these are good questions. All right, so. It's my job. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's go. But let's go. Let's unpack it backwards. The money for the book, because this is what usually people in and. Damn, like, I can't believe this is my life. I tell my wife that almost daily. I can't believe this is my life. So a lot of people reach out to me a lot about two things, speaking and writing. Yep. Right? I've, uh, I've had a lot of success in both in eight years. So writing a book. 
people are like, hey, can you connect me with a publisher, with a literary agent, whatever? And I tell them the same thing every time. First of all, publisher, you got to ask yourself, do you think you can sell 10,000 copies of a book? Because if you think you can sell 10,000 copies, now it's time to go talk to a publisher. But if you don't think you're going to sell more than 10,000 copies, self-publish this thing. Because there's nothing wrong with self-publishing a book, you know? But if you want to go into being a writer, first of all, you need to go into it with the mindset that you're, the likelihood of you making money being a writer, you might want to find a second job. Because there's not a lot of money selling books. There's, and, and, and Dan, I mean, I've, I've sold a lot of books. The Coffee Beans probably sold half a million copies. I've made good money selling it. But the thing I know about books is you've got to keep writing books to be an author. And like I'm right now, I'm I'm like I'm under a deadline with my publisher to produce another book. It'll be my sixth book. I've written five now. I got to do my sixth book coming up. So you got to keep feeding the beast. But sitting down to write a book, this is what I tell people too. The very first like pages of a book, I give an author seven pages to get my attention. If you don't get my attention in seven pages, you're out of there, man. I'm, and I got that in prison. I would I read probably a book every other day in prison. I read voraciously when I was in prison. And I give an author seven pages. If it didn't work, I'd throw the book at the cell wall. That was done, man. Um, you've got to catch people's attention right away in a book, especially with these short attention spans. I think you call it the ADHD attention span that people have. Think about social media, how quick they want to change screens. In the first couple pages, you've got to get people's attention. So you've got to do something. I believe storytelling is one of the best ways to write any kind of a book. And you can write a business book, whatever. You can write an um, um, informational kind of book using storytelling to do it. You know, you have a principle. You tell a story behind that principle. And then you have the application of the principle. It's almost like the, the formula that John Gordon uses for all his books. He uses storytelling a lot to tell about these principles. And I think that's what people like. That's what they can digest. And break it down into, you don't want long chapters. You don't want a long book. You talked about this on one of your shows the other day, long text messages. Think about the same thing with a book. You don't have to have long chapters or a big book. A lot of people look at a big book. They're overwhelmed by it. Oh, yeah. Overwhelmed by it. But 140 pages, mm -hmm. they can knock that out, yep. you know? So I think the formula is to like keep it simple and keep it as short as possible. Yeah. Both my books are under 100 pages, and they look like a guide. Yeah. It's how to set up your business for under $1,000, how to set up your personal brand for under $1,000. And I'm writing my third book, which will be my final of the series, called How to Set Up Your Events for Under $1,000. And same thing. It'll be under 100 pages, nice and easy. But so many people tell me, yeah, I breezed through the book in one day. I'm like, perfect. Good. <laughs> I'm not trying to overwhelm you. <laughs> okay. So we talked a bit about speaking. We talked a bit about being an author. Now it's, you got money. You start to make some money. You're getting 10K, 25K, 50K, 100K, 10K, 25K, 50K, 100K. That adds up when you're doing a lot of events every single month across Most the definitely. country. Like you said, you're doing seven figures a year. And I've done events for speaking. all those numbers you've done out. Right. All the way up to 100. Exactly. So. When is it the time for you to start thinking about investing in the things and what interests you from the investing side of the world? Good question. So here's the deal about investing too, is like I came from a world where I was a broker. Once I was studying to be a broker at UBS, I'm getting ready to take my series seven when I first get hooked on meth, right? So I understand investment of money in the traditional sense through the exchanges. I understand that, but I don't want to be responsible for my own money. So I have a broker. I'm not going to be the one to make this. Decision. It's kind of like the whole idea that, um, you know, anybody, anybody that represents himself in a court of law is a fool for a client. So <laughs> on, on my end with what I've been through and the, the rules, the SEC, and this is just strictly with me because the Security Exchange Commission does not like felons near sure. the stock market. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get their attention in any way. So I've turned it over to a broker. Now, that's a very small percentage of the, of the money that I make. The other thing I've done with my money that I've made is I've invested in, first of all, I want to say this, keep the main thing the main thing is what I learned a long time ago. Like if my main thing is the speaking business, how do I pour in more into the speaking business? You know, and so there were different ways that I could do to invest in me and grow my business. And I've done that. Um, you know, I'm still doing different things. One of them uh, was uh, getting a publicist out of uh, Beverly Hills to help me get more exposure out there. And they recently got me a People Magazine article. And, so and investing in yourself. Investing in yourself. Right. Keep the main thing the main thing. And while this business is building, then you have extra money. The next investment I made was my wife. My wife, Kendall, she runs the business side of the speaking company. 
But there was an opportunity there. We were getting ready to build this house. We're working on building a house right now. We're in, we're in the process of it. But when we were clearing the land, this guy that came out there with the excavators and everything said, hey, I'm looking to sell my company. Do you know anybody want to buy it? So I sat down with my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my wife, and I said, hey, we could buy this thing, and we could actually put it in my wife and mother-in-law's name. And it's a female-owned business. And it's a demolition and construction company called Divas of Destruction. <laughs> so, yeah. So, really <laughs> so my wife and my mother-in-law have their own company. And my, the money, some of the money I've made and my father-in-law has made have seeded this company. And, um, you know, starting a business is tough, brother. I mean, it's, you know, this business is right under two years old. And you can see when someone has to make payroll, that's a really, like, wild thing to watch, man. I've sure. watched my wife and them you know making that payroll every week and it's um that's somebody that when when someone's had to make payroll i'll listen to them about business stuff you know because that's a hard thing to do yeah, i got thousands of employees yeah so you you <laughs> you, know, you know this man and that, well, amongst you talk, all the companies yeah. yeah when you were talking about that with the merger that y'all just that you just did with the events thing i mean that's a lot of people man and making yeah. payroll is is tough and, and they don't have thousands of employees. they got like 30 employees now but 30, i mean 30 is a lot yeah 30 is a lot so there's been struggle growth a lot of lessons you learn, some of the best lessons you learn are when your money's involved and you lose it because you make a bad investment. So here's, a, here's why I made some a bad investments, all right? And this is why I say keep the main thing the main thing. So as we're building Divas of Destruction, my father-in-law says, hey, let's go build some houses, you know, because now we control some of the construction equipment, stuff like that. We'll go build some houses. This sounded great in 2021. The houses got finished in February of 2023. Guess what people aren't buying right now? Houses, you know, your interest rates going up, what, seven something percent right now. Um, so people are scared off from the market, which to me is a little bit crazy. Like if you want to buy a house and you're saying, well, I'm going to wait till the interest rates go down. That's a little bit nutty because the interest rates may never go down, you know. So if there's something. Not you, during election year. Yeah. And if, <laughs> so if there's something. A couple years. If there's something you really want to do, just go do it. And you can refinance later. Right. But I'm sitting on three houses in Bridge City, Texas right now. They're luxury homes that my father-in-law and I built. And Dan, in December, they get they they turn one years old, and we haven't been able to sell any of them, man. And so that's that'll be a million dollars that's lost if we can't sell those houses. But you're gonna make some some bad investments along the way, but you'll learn some big lessons from that too. So since Damon mentioned payroll, I'm gonna walk you guys through my payroll life because I like to give you guys behind the scenes exact details. I tell you about my houses, my cars, my investments, my animals. I spend 9,200 bucks a week in hay from feeding my animals outside. Like I walk you through real life details. So on the payroll side, I have Elevator Studio, which is also the masterminds and everything beneath that, which is 18 employees. Now with this new investment in the partnership with Aspire Tour and Collective Influence, the parent company, we have 85 employees and growing, mostly based in Jacksonville, Florida. Cars and Coffee, we have nine retail stores, 36 employees. Most of our employees range from $3,000 to $10,000 a month in salary. Most of the, mostly it's 3000 to 6000 and then some executives would be around eight to 10000 On some of the other companies, like Elevator Studio, or Masterminds, et cetera, you have some employees that are making ten grand a month, twelve grand a month, and you know the super high level are getting twenty grand a month, twenty five grand a month because they are to keep them. You got to make it competitive. That's a lot of. That's a good salary. Right. So you can start to add up what's happening here. On Everbowl side, me and some friends own seventeen of the locations. There's 140 employees amongst those locations. Parent company, I don't even know anymore because we have 70-something locations open. There must be between 600 and 800 employees now. Everbowl is a parent company. I don't own that. I'm just one of the big investors in it. I do own the majority of uh, six, or sorry, 17 of those locations with the 140 employees. Here at the ranch, we're at Black Sight Ranch, the wild jungle. We have 12 full-time employees just to focus on the animals, not to counting the landscaping and everything that goes on with 26 acres here at the ranch. So that's elevator, cars and coffee. We got the ranch, the mastermind business. We have the Spire Tour Collective Influence. I'm trying to think. Of, I got some other companies. And then from the investment side, obviously, I don't count those as my payroll because that's not my monthly overhead. But those companies collectively have thousands of employees because I've done 43 angel investments personally. Last two years, our syndicate, Elevator Syndicate, you guys can see that at elevatorsyndicate.com, we raised $44 million for those companies. We put in 3 to $6 million per company. They've now hired hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more employees which is almost like charity to me in the sense of it's kind of like the teaching the fish instead of mm -hmm. you just give them a fish by funding $44 million in companies the last two years. We're creating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs, hopefully thousands of jobs. So that's a little bit of my behind the scenes on the payroll side. I'm trying to think of what I'm missing. There's a lot of moving parts here of my world, but 
I want you guys to think about most of the time for your overhead, your employees are going to make between three and five grand, three and six grand, two grand, four grand, five grand a month, depending on the city or state that you're in. Okay, that's going to be a higher in California, lower in some Midwest states, and an average out or dollar cost average based on the state you're in, also based on the income and the taxes, the tax bracket that you're in, based on your state. When you go get high level executives, you're talking about six grand to 10 grand a month and more, especially if you're in California, Miami, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, some of these top tier cities, you're going to have some people you're going to try to wrestle with to get them for 10 grand, 12 grand, 15 grand a month, which is crazy to think about when you need more than one of them. So really consider for yourself the most biggest reason, the main reason that a lot of companies fail is their overhead gets too high. Mm -hmm. So if you think about from my perspective, when I walked you through Elevator Studio, this is a company that's done over $60 million. I have 18 employees. Where VaynerMedia has 900 employees or more. Gary's probably got 1,000 plus employees now. It's a very big overhead, but he's building a multi-billion dollar company. There's risk reward to that scenario. I, w I did Elevator Studio. I have no partners, no investors, no shareholders. It's just me and my CEO are the only ones that own that company. But I don't want to scale it. I like the $60 million number. I like 18 employees. I like low overhead. Even with cars and coffee, every one of our stores that we open is three to five employees. That's it. Yeah. I keep our rent between three grand and eight grand a month. I keep our overhead of three to five employees. Let's scale it. When you look at Everbowl. Those stores are like 500 to 1500 square feet. So your rent's like two grand to six grand a month. The employees make 15 bucks to 20 bucks an hour. Like you just think about what the things I'm trying to scale. I need to be able to replicate it. And that's why I'm so obsessed with Everbowl is I don't have to hire chefs. I don't need managers. Right. I can hire high school kids and college kids that are happy to work there. They're making a good 15, 20 bucks an hour serving blueberries and raspberries and strawberries. Right. And you have an endless source of potential employees whenever you need Correct. to fill in the spot. You because you're going to have to do that. You lose a chef at your fancy restaurant. Whew, That's tough. Good luck finding another chef. That's really tough. Anyway, so I digress. Like we're going to go over to the last section, which we're going to talk about charity. Can so. I say something about that real quick? Yeah, go though? for it. That it's so, it, but, so in because I listen to all your stuff, man. And so my wife and I were listening to one of your episodes, and you are talking about the payroll side because – one of the things you said you've done is you've helped companies make payroll. So, like, their company, Divas of Destruction, they do a lot of work in the – they have a lot of refineries where I live in southeast Texas. The biggest refinery in the world is in Port Arthur, where I was born. Um, but they do a lot of work inside the plants. Well, here's the deal. When you work inside the plants, you get paid net 30. So, if you're making payroll every week, but you get net 30, you've got to be able to cover payroll for four straight weeks without any money coming in. Right. And you said that you've done that with companies before sure. too. And you know, but and and we didn't do that. We got this close to having to do that with it with with the company to help us make the ends meet on that. But that was a lot of out of pocket expense that yeah. came from the speaking business to fund that because, you know, thirty people covering payroll for four weeks before you see <laughs> your money back on that first sure, week. It's a lot. That was tough, but we we survived it. We got through it, Dan. We got through it. And I mean, you know, knock on wood, you're gonna have overhead. You're gonna have events happen, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, man, it's um, I learned a lot about starting a business um by making mistakes, and I've learned a lot about watching other people's mistakes, and I want to make those. And I learned a lot from listening to shows like yours, brother. Last section, we talk about charity. How do you give it away to the people? Now, as I've mentioned before, charity is not only about money. It can be your time, effort, and energy power of your cell phone, power of your actions, the butterfly effect of inviting a bunch of people to get behind a cause, whether it's a toy drive, Thanksgiving food drive, helping the homeless, helping children, helping people in prison. Walk us through why you're passionate about it. I think I know why you're passionate about it, but walk us through how you do it. What's the concept behind you and prison reform? Yeah, so I, whenever I was in prison, Dan, one of the hardest things to see was these men I'm locked up with. They would get letters from their family or on the phone. You have, they have prison phones in their phone calls or visits. And they would come back, they're crying. They're broken men, you know. And, and I was like, hey, what's wrong? Man, it's my son or my daughter. They're, they're doing this, they're doing that. They want to get involved with this or that. I, we can't afford it. I'm in here. There's no dad at home, right? And, um, um, and there's the concern. You could see it in these men. They're gonna, those kids are going to go down the same path as them because generational incarceration is a very real thing. Sure. And I always thought to myself, man, if I ever get out of prison and I build a platform up, this is one of the things I want to address. So I... Uh, I started a foundation called the Be a Coffee Bean Foundation. It's a 501c3. And, and what I would tell people about giving your money away, uh, there's different levels of, of charitable organizations. And I, th I think, you know, the the ones, you, there's ones like mine, you can get 60% back. You know, it's a 60% tax deduction. Um, there's no 100% one that I've seen out there, but 60% is where you come in at the 501c3 level. 
But I started this foundation off because uh, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to address this. And my wife and I put our money into it. We raised money for it. We have a program called Coffee Bean Cares. Cares is an acronym, stands for Cultivating Activities and Relationships Through Extracurricular Scholarships. What we do at Cares is we say, hey, look, any child in America that has an incarcerated parent anywhere, you are eligible for a one-year scholarship for $2,500 per year for any extracurricular activity you want to do. Say a little boy wants to play t-ball or baseball right. or, or select sports or a little girl wants to take dance or a little boy wants to take dance whatever piano lessons guitar we got a we've got a little girl that wanted to take guitar lessons so we bought her a guitar found her a guitar teacher you know her dad's in prison we give the fam the family member the guardian the parent whatever that's taking care of the kid twenty five hundred dollars a year and they can apply it to and it's an honor system we don't track it we don't make sure he's in his receipts and stuff like that but up to twenty five hundred dollars a year we will provide to make sure that they have access to extracurricular activities that's one of the reasons we do it to keep the kids busy. But the other reason is we want the parent that's incarcerated, the man or woman that's in prison to be able to take credit for this scholarship. So now they have something positive to talk about in phone calls and letters from prison, right? Now that the visits of visitation, you know, the dad can say to his daughter, how's those dance lessons? I got you because a guy in prison doesn't have any money. Of course. You know, you can't pay for dance lessons with soups and coffee and stamps. You know, you can't pay for select sports with and select sports are expensive, man. My little stepdaughter takes, you know, uh, dance competition, select dance. It's expensive. So, but we want to rebuild that parent child bond. That's one of the things I think is really important. So we put a lot of effort and our money behind that initiative. Um, another thing we do is we try to help out locally with the, you know, youth football in our area, youth sports in our area, just different things that people reach out to us and say, Hey, you know, can you donate some time or some money to this? We do a lot of money to that locally. One of the things that, all right, so this is one of the things I got really heavy with. Uh, and during COVID, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, who is the people that own me till 2073, they have my parole. They reached out to me. The parole board reached out to me and said, hey, listen, could you create a curriculum for the prison system hmm. that can teach other men and women how to think like you? Because they said this could be a huge shift in the mindsets of if prisoners. If we could teach them how to have the principles Damon West has in life, then you can change the way people think, and that could change their family trees forever. Could you build a curriculum? I'm like, well, I've never built a curriculum, but I'll figure out how to do it. So the curriculum launched last year. It's called Be the Change Prison Curriculum. It's all out of my pocket. Don't you know? I have a partner in it. We pay for it. Everything's out of pocket. And every every four months, we graduate a class with 30 men. And these graduation ceremonies are incredible, Dan. And, and we, I put a lot of money into these ceremonies because I want them to be something that people talk about in prison. On one side of the chapel in the prison are the 30 guys graduating. And they all have caps and gowns on because a lot of these men have never worn a cap and gown. You know, they've never graduated from anything. On the other side of the chapel, there's 30 men that are about to take the class next. They're seeing what success looks like. And so the, the warden, the, the prison director has let me run the graduation. What else do you want, Damon? Well, here's what I want. I want family members to be there to see these men in caps right. and gowns. For sure. So the family members are there, their mothers, their fathers, their, their wives, their kids get to come in to see dad dressed up in a cap and gown. They see the success. Um, another thing we do at the, at the ceremonies, I have really nice food brought in. Food's a very big motivator in prison, Dan. It's hard to get good food in prison. Like food is horrible in prison by design. So I bring in, I cater in, I get a good meal. And I, and I always have the caterer bring the meal in about 30 minutes into an hour presentation, an hour graduation ceremony. Because I want those guys to start smelling that food. Because once the guys start smelling, it's like a Pavlovian response, man. You start drooling and stuff like that. And when the ceremony's over, I tell all the guys that are just graduating, all right, you men that have graduated, we're going to practice some of the stuff we learned. Because servant leadership, Dan, I think is the, the secret to life. The secret to life is serving others, helping other people reach their goals in life. You know, when we're helping other people, that's when we're at our best. So I tell these guys that have just graduated, you're servant leaders now, and leaders eat last. You're going to get up and serve everybody in this chapel. You know, all these other inmates, all the other family members, everybody there, the guards, everybody. And when you're done serving everybody, then you get to eat too. And trust me on this, there's enough food to go around. Because the first thing they're thinking is, man, there won't be any food left. There's plenty of food. I buy extra. But I want these men to understand that delayed gratification, self-control, and service above self. That's what it's all about, man. Serving other people, and um, so I do a lot with that. I, another thing I do. Gotta wrap it up. Okay, <laughs> I want to keep it under forty minutes. We're way over. So another thing I do is um, the um, the the guy that taught me the coffee bean story in county jail, Mr. Jackson. I, I went out to try to find him when I got out of prison. He was dead, so I found his family and I started a scholarship in his name. He's from the inner city of Dallas. 
So it, in his old high school every year, Dallas Lincoln, I have a ten thousand. I put ten thousand dollars every year into a trust for a scholarship in his name, the James Land Baker the second, be a coffee bean scholarship. His family picks the winner every year. So one little boy or one little girl gets that scholarship every year. And then the last thing is, I've got four guys that were really good to me in prison. One of them is the guy that taught me how to use the law library. Every month, I put a hundred dollars in their books. They don't have family to take care of them, but they were just kind to this person named Damon West that passed through their life one day in prison. And because of that kindness, I reward them every month with taking care of them for the rest of their lives. All right, guys, you are listening to the Money Mondays here with Damon West, three-time best-selling author. Check out his book called The Coffee Bean. Also, visit us on themoneymondays.com. As you know, we do a Zoom call every Monday at four o'clock PST, where I do live Q and A. Uh, either myself or one of our executives will do speeches there. I'll probably get Damon to jump in there one of these Mondays to do a speech, and then he'll do live Q and A in there. So you can go to moneymondays.com to join us there. That does cost 200 bucks a month. We then donate all the proceeds to the toy drive. We have the world's largest toy drive coming up in December from December 2nd to the 17th. We're going to 10 cities in 15 days. Don't ask me how, but we're going to do it <laughs> so for our 10-year anniversary. So as I always say, we all grew up thinking it's rude to talk about money. I think it's rude to not talk about money. And that's why we're here talking about literally every detail from prison to rent to payroll, overhead, and everything in between to have these blunt discussions because it's important to have these topics talked about since we grew up thinking that we couldn't talk about it. Now we can. That's the concept of this podcast. So keep sharing it. We've been number one on the entrepreneur category for 136 days in a row. That's all because of you guys commenting, liking, sharing, reviewing, forward to your friends, repost us, and we'll see you guys next Monday.